Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Welcome back, everyone, to the Wilder Ride Listener's Lounge, where we get a chance to look at a special guest moment by moment in their life, rather than a movie one minute at a time. It's a place where Walt and I get to invite guests that we've either met, people in our lives, or people we'd still like to learn more about to come on and chat with us about their lives, their accomplishments, and then we have a little bit of fun along the way. As you heard from the intro, I'm your host, Alan Sanders, joined by my co-host in crime, Walt. Walt, how you doing? I'm doing great. What's going on, Alan? It's been it's been a week. I'm telling you that, but it's been uh, both busy and and hectic, but also weather finally you know shaping up. Looking forward to some camping. Um, I just feel like I don't know. Maybe heading into the third or the, me, the turn, heading into the fourth quarter, are, are things starting to show glimmer, or are we just getting excited about the end of the year? Or I I, I can't figure it out. There's a lot of energy out there. Yeah, I think everybody's ready for 2020 to be done. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe maybe that's what I'm sensing. <laughs> yeah, it seems like everybody on social media, everybody in the media. Well, I think also we're headed up to an election, which is going to be hotly contested. And uh, it's just it's just crazy. It's just mayhem. And I'm trying to kind of stay off of social media as much as I can because it's just gotten so bitter and nasty. And uh, I'm just kind of done. You know, with what I do, I still have to engage, but I found myself reacting less and just hitting the retweet on people that have already said kind of what I would want to say just to keep, you know, the profile filled and maybe gain new listeners and followers or whatever. But, you know, I just feel like there's a there's a giant group of people on one side that it doesn't matter. You could show them like all of the facts in the world and they're going to stay where they are and you could show all those same facts to the group on the other side, they're going to stay where they are. So it's like everyone's like eating their popcorn, watching for what the five or 10% in the middle are going to do. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, and, you know, you and I are on social media a lot, and it's almost like a, a playground for insanity. And people who are normally pretty well-adjusted human beings get, get on social media and they lose their mind. And yeah, you know, my wife did this test and cause she is, and she understands her personality. She definitely is got that New Yorker style of, you know, quick to feel the blood boil. Um, she, she did a test. She put a, a blood pressure monitor on her. We've got one cause what, what she does as a personal trainer. So she's got a pulse ox monitor, a blood pressure monitor, just some different things because some of her clients are entering or, or at the start of their golden years. A lot of them are first time grandparents and so she works out with a lot of people who are trying to make sure they have that core strength to be able to do things like pick up a car seat and put it inside the back seat of the car, leaning over with their back with a, you know, a toddler in it and trying to make sure that they can get it in place. And so, so she's got this gear and she decided she was going to just hook it up when she was just at a kind of steady, just a calm, just sitting back, relaxed, the, the, the evening's done, dog in the lap, you know, and got sort of a baseline. And then with that baseline, leaving everything hooked up, she started looking through her social media, especially Facebook. And after 10 minutes, she checked it again. Her blood pressure was up. Her heart rate was up. She said Uh, it had an actual physical reaction on me. And it wasn't heart rate up because it was like, you know, people showing, you know, Magic Mike shirtless dancing or something. It was the content in her feed. And not that she was responding, not that she found herself typing or anything, just going through it. And I said, I bet if you did the same thing to people watching the nightly news, the talking heads, the network TV, you'd feel the same way. It's all designed to give you an emotional response because an emotional response means you're apt to either click on a link or you maybe uh, you're apt to watch a little bit longer or you're apt to then go talk about what you just saw on that channel. So it's no longer about necessarily the dry, dull, who, what, when, where, why, how. It's let me tell you how you should be feeling about this. And it creates a reaction. And unfortunately for a lot of people, it's a negative reaction. Yeah. Well, and you seem to kind of stumble across the people who you disagree with the most, the most often. And 
So I, I don't know what it is. I don't know how the algorithms work in social media, but they really knew, do know how to, to light your fires. And you watch that show, The Social Network, right? I haven't seen it yet. Is, are you talking about the documentary? Yeah, I haven't seen it either, but a friend of mine was just telling me that there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there of like how they manipulate people, how they keep people interested and paying attention and, and all that. And I can feel that. And uh, I, I need to watch the, the documentary, I guess. But but here's the sad thing. And, you know, we, you and I are both living testaments of the kind of relationships and kind of the cool parts of the web and, and of social media as well. We've got folks overseas. We've got folks in other countries that we engage with, other states that we talk to that we've never met physically and yet have some fantastic interactions and conversations thanks to social media. So you can't in one breath say, well, it's horrible. Get rid of it because there is good. But on the flip side, you're like, God, it's so horrible. We should get rid of it. Right. Right. I, I, I wish we could get back to that thing of like sharing pictures of our dogs and our kids and, you know, good things in our lives, <laughs> you know, cause like, I'm not going to convince anybody of my political views or whatever. Now I might take a couple of jabs at friends of mine, but even that has become not in fun anymore. And so it's like, I just need to be careful and stick to, you know, Gene Wilder stuff and, and, uh, and those sorts of things instead of getting in all the other craziness. Yeah. Instead you and I, uh, we rip open the age old wound Star Trek versus Star Wars. That doesn't do anything to people's Uh, emotions. No, Star Trek. (laughs) (laughs) Unless it's empire and then it's Star Wars. Right. Well, yeah, true. True enough. So so yeah, we, but you can't, it's such a minefield. You can't go any direction without without stepping on a landmine. It's crazy. And you know what's funny? With, with And I know we're just kind of, this has become a more philosophical opening. We didn't talk about what we've, what we've done this week, but what what's amazing. Stepped on landmines. We, exactly. Where's my toes? Uh, what's amazing is when Facebook first came out, when the advent of social media, before that MySpace, you actually found yourself, at least I did, having back and forth sort of, conversations. Well, here's where I think about this. Oh yeah. Well, here's what I think about that. And it became, I don't know what happened. I don't know where along the way, if, if it's the programming, if it's because we've become so desensitized to politeness or we've decided we don't have to have that kind of common sense decorum we would have in face-to-face conversations. People just go all in. It's like, Oh, you disagree. Time to light the match and throw in a can of gasoline. It's, it's, you can't even have a discourse. And it's sort of sad because we've got this powerful tool that would allow us to be able to engage with almost anybody on the planet. And yet we find ourselves getting more and more withdrawn. You know, I think part of the problem is that early on, like you said, when the internet first started growing, you intentionally had to go to a room about weightlifting or a room about Star Trek or a room about, you know, politics. Yeah, you had to join a forum. Yes. And so you had to intentionally say, okay, I'm going to go in this group. And you knew what that group was about. Now you just open Facebook and you get hit with whatever is next. And so you don't have that ability to kind of filter out and say, well, I'm just going to go talk to my friends about swimming or weightlifting or the Atlanta Braves. (laughs) You now open it and get hit with one of your buddies saying something offensive about your political opinion or, you know, whatever, or you're, you get hit with the Atlanta Falcons blowing another lead in the fourth quarter, <laughs> just screw up another game. And Thanks it totally Twitter depresses for putting you. that in my header. I appreciate <laughs> right. that. I that's, needed to really see that. <laughs> that's what I needed first thing this morning. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Woohoo! Thank you, Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And then it's, then you start with why haven't they fired the coach yet? Why are we still dealing with this? Why haven't the Falcons ever won a game? <laughs> And, you know, and it goes downhill from there. So, well, you know what I can tell you secretly what I'm hoping for right now is I'm hoping this is the great grand strategy is the Falcons are going to, you know, just lose every game in spectacular fashion without making it look like they're intentionally losing every game. So okay, we'll get the first pick. They're off and, and we'll going. Get, <laughs> all right. They're, I mean, they're, they're already 0-3 on this. Or in some ways, if that's the plan, they're 3-0 and on their plan. Right. Um, <laughs> they're perfect so far. <laughs> that's exactly what they want to achieve. But I think I would love, go, go 0-16, fire Dan Quinn, get the first pick, bring Trevor Lawrence in, let him work with 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 Chandler, uh, not Chandler, Jesus Christ, with Matt Ryan for one season, 
get him really, you know, because Matt Ryan's a good quarterback. I feel bad for Matt Ryan. Uh, Matt Ryan is too. putting up awesome numbers. You know, the, just if you have him as your fantasy quarterback, you're like, wow, he's racking up points every week. But the team sucks because <laughs> yeah. they lose right. every game. I mean, if, you, if I said to you, hey, you're going to score 40 points and lose, you go like, what? In the NFL? Yeah. Yep. Every the, week. The Falcons, yeah, they figured that out. Every week. It's like the indoor football. You, you put up 76 points and lose. So I don't get it. Well, you know what? As we start to, to, to wind this down, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, the NFL may or may not even finish their season. I'm hoping they will. I'm hoping actually in the grand scheme of things with college football entering now their fourth week. Well, by the time people hear this, their sixth week, uh, you know, with a lot of stuff still going on and people seeing, well, wait a minute, everything's still okay. You know, maybe we can stop this nonsense and get back to normal. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I mean, I feel like we're headed in the right direction from that standpoint that, you know, things are coming back. Shows are actually in production. Shows and movies are actually in production now. Um, things seem to be headed back in the right direction. So um, I hope so. Well, you know what? Somebody that can help maybe give us a little bit of perspective because, you know, just you and I, we're, we're, we're bitching about how bad social media is. You and I have yet to have to worry about going into armed combat. We've yet to deal with, I don't know, uh, you know, bank robbers and killers and, and, and child nappers and all the things that you deal with in law enforcement. We've actually got a guest who may be able to put us down and say, you guys don't understand what stress is. <laughs> well, and, and it, you don't know the stress of raising me, my brother and sister. And <laughs> dude, I know a little bit because I got to deal with you. <laughs> so just magnify you. I've yeah. seen your knucklehead brother. I mean, I can't imagine the two of you are like wonder twin powers activate you become like the greater than the sum of your individual parts you turn yeah. into some unique kind of uh, of idiot <laughs> <laughs> yeah so today we uh we have a really special guest and special maybe in uh, many unique ways but um we're gonna have my dad on the show today so you know and i'm so glad you said that because i wanted to let you do the honors because normally i drive a lot of this and and we go back and forth but I mean, this is really cool because I, I didn't get a chance to do this before my dad passed away. I didn't get a chance to have him as part of a show or an interview to talk about his career in the military, about all the adventures he's, he went on as, a, as an adult through the Vietnam War, all the way through to even, you know, parts of what he did is, uh, in, in Fort McPherson, supporting the Gulf War, supporting the war in Iraq and all the other in initiatives that we were doing. So I want you to welcome to our stage the guest today. Well, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And it is it is a kind of a cool honor to do this. I've bugged my dad for years about writing a book or uh, sitting down with him and recording some stories and just saving those for the grandkids. So I'm glad that we have the opportunity today. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned quite a few times on the show that I've grown, grown up in a law enforcement and military family. So now everybody gets to see the warped mind that uh, <laughs> that, that, that created this. So uh my dad, George Murray, is joining us today. And um, when I was born in the late 60s, my dad was actually in FBI training. So I've been kind of around all of uh, that craziness, but uh, he was in Vietnam before that. And uh, so we're just going to take some time and pick his brain and hear some stories and then let him talk about some of the other stuff that he's involved with now um, that uh, I think is pretty cool that he hasn't just retired fully to play golf all the time, but that he's actually doing some other productive stuff too. So uh, I guess we get to welcome to the stage, my dad, George Murray. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, Alan. Glad to be with you again. Well, we, we appreciate you joining us, dad. And, uh, you know, I've wanted to do this for a little while. And so it just worked out great. We had uh, somebody who couldn't be with us and you were available and uh, Yanni cut you loose from all your responsibilities around the house to be able to spend some time with us. Or either that or she was like, yeah, great, go, go do something else. Leave me alone. I think you got that. <laughs> now, I want you to understand, said another way, you are our backup and you are not the person we initially wanted. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, no seriously, well, I am so happy we have you. It's kind of like in the Braves bullpen. I'm that guy that's the last one down there. Uh, probably a Charlie Culberson who comes out of the bullpen who has never thrown a ball to the plate and they put him in. So 
Okay, that's me. Well, well, it, it, I think it's more the, hey, do we know anybody who can talk for an hour? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I know somebody. <laughs> well, it's so funny because I mentioned to you, I said, I, I, the guy I was trying to get, they changed their recording night. So we're going to have to figure out what to do to get Tim Andrews on from Radio Labyrinth. So we'll work on that. And I was like, you know, we're two weeks ahead. The reason we had the two-week buffer gives us this chance that if something falls apart the last minute, technical problems, power outage, you know, things happen. That's why we have that two-week buffer. I was like, we could technically skip. And you're like, hold on, my dad would be a great guest. I'm like, yeah, your dad would be a great guest because I had the chance to interview him on my radio show one Saturday during some of the uh, Senate investigations and other things going on with the FBI to get a former FBI agent's perspective. So I was like, hey, that'd be really cool because... Much like my dad, although he wasn't law enforcement, we could start right at the very beginning with uh, the military background, and I'll open it up and say, what was it that, you know, I guess the draft was going on at that time. How did you feel when you got the news that you would be not only serving in this man's army, but going uh, overseas to Vietnam? Well, actually, uh, I was uh, in ROTC at Mississippi State, Starkville, Mississippi, the finest place you could ever (laughs) Uh, well, they beat LSU this week, so uh, we beat LSU. And uh, if you bring that up, uh, I've been voted out of the neighborhood for ringing the cowbell Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, and, and my old Miss neighbor shot himself, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, since you bring up LSU, Mississippi State, yeah, we beat their brains out. So uh, uh, of course. They could have put their girls' softball team out there, and if we'd beaten them, we'd have been happy. <laughs> so beating LSU is the top of the top of the heap. National champs, and we went to Death Valley and did it. No, congratulations on that. Although we probably need to leave off the fact that about fifteen of their key players all went to the draft, and so it's a completely different <laughs> LSU care. team. Doesn't, Doesn't matter. matter. Does not care. We still <laughs> won. It does not matter. On paper, LSU lost. That's right. right. Well, I've been hearing every year since 1968 that this is the year for the Mississippi State National Championship. So (laughs) I I know what fuel this fires over in Starkville. (laughs) So you were in uh, ROTC in college. So you were already thinking about maybe a career in the military and then going toward the officer side. Yeah, they... uh, uh... ROTC at that time required the first two years of college, you had to be in it. And uh, the second two years were voluntary. (laughs) They paid you $12 a month. I needed the money. Uh, (laughs) And it was very early. We're in 1961, 62. And I love reading newspapers and the news. And I was aware that uh, the military was engaged over there and that the draft was going to come. So I was uh, hopped into advanced ROTC. Now, I will tell you that there they promised if we'd go through their little flight program, they would uh, send us to Germany. We'd fly on the east-west German border, waiting for the Russians to come through to fill the gap. I'm not sure what single helicopter was going to do to stop that, but I believed them. So uh, off I went, second lieutenant, uh, armor. That time you had to serve uh, in a armor unit for a year before you could go to flight school. So I went to the wonderful world of Fort Stewart, Georgia. Oorah! And and the good side of that is that that's where I met Walt's mom. She was teaching <laughs> school on post, and uh, she fell for my uh, my line, and uh, we were married for forty four years. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so, uh, she at one point said, you know, you told me you were going to Germany, but I can read the paper too. And I figured you gotta be going to Vietnam. Everybody else is. So, uh, we went through ROTC, uh, did the, uh, year in a armor unit at Fort Stewart. And, uh, of course, as any veteran will tell you, especially second lieutenant types, you have a choice. You can make decisions and be in charge or you can depend on NCOs who know what they're doing. My NCO was a guy named Sergeant Hilton. He had had about 20 years in the Army, and he gave me my choice. I could run the unit, and we would fail completely, or he would tell me what orders to give, and we would succeed. That's what we did. 
You know what? My dad told me the exact same thing because I was I, I went in the Navy. Um, uh, unfortunately, at the time I went, they didn't value degrees in psychology and English as being valuable. They wanted engineers, so I was not offered an OCS role. But my dad always said that if you ever got in and became an officer, uh, his his advice always was, and this is actually his advice, no matter where, whatever job, he said, you might be the hot shot with the title and people might have to take orders from you. But if you don't find the guy that's been around for 20 years that actually knows what's going on and you don't put you don't pull them under your wing and listen to their tutelage, you're going to fail. And I've learned that my whole life, that every time I think I know something, it turns out I should have just asked the person that's been there before me. Well, Sergeant Hilton and definitely. And oh, by the way, uh, Seaman Sand, as I heard your little thing on uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll her back. Uh, so I know the title. <laughs> Thank you. You had to mention the the actual title of the E three. You couldn't have said E three. You had well, to say semen. I get right. it. I get it. It's a well, joke. I, I ah. still like that your dad is Colonel Sanders. <laughs> my, yeah. So oh yeah, we're full of fun names at our house. Colonel Sanders, Seaman Sanders. Well, Might as well just get the barrel and put it out back on the porch and just start taking numbers. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so I've answered your question of how I got there. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. So now that was obviously you were, you were young, you were second Lieutenant, you were a boot over there. How, what were your experiences that if, if any, that you want to share? I mean, how many, did you do a, a year, two years? How many terms tours were you over there? I did one, 360 days, uh, uh, riding in Vietnam, uh, in uh, March, uh, late February, March of 1966 returned at the end of February 67. And uh, we had married six months before I went over, which uh, we in later years laughed about that we should have not done that because she went back to Brunswick and lived with her family at Brunswick, Georgia and taught school that year. And uh, that was not a fun ordeal for her. But I reported to the 173rd Airborne, which was a brigade uh, station near Benoit, that uh, had come to Vietnam in May of 65 and had already been in a lot of combat. Uh, our unit was the 335th Assault Helicopter Company assigned to them as their helicopter support unit. We flew under uh, call sign Cowboys and Falcons, and we we're laughing about the great Falcons football team, but what had happened when you arrive in country as a new unit you had to have a radio call sign. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the guys decided we would be the take the Dallas Cowboys and the Atlanta Falcons, the two new NFL teams. So the uh, troop lift helicopters were the Cowboys and the guns were the Falcons. Uh, I did uh, 365 days. Most of my time is in the troop carriers known as slicks. And I have a little bit of uh, gun time, uh, mainly because m one of my best friends was a gun platoon leader, and I got a little gun time. We all wanted to be in gunship platoon, but it, it was a, a waiting line to get in. Now, you will know that uh, in the Vietnam experience, especially in the helicopter aviation, we had a lot of warrant offs, and warrant offs that could uh, be a high school grad who decided he wanted to come into the service for the helicopter program. He would go through basic training and then about an 18 months officer candidate school, which would graduate him as a warrant officer one. He uh, did not have command responsibility. He had only technical pilot responsibility. So in the units, the aircraft commander might be a warrant officer who had more Experience than say a, a second lieutenant, first lieutenant that I was. Uh, mm -hmm. But as time went by, the uh, lieutenants, captains uh, led the assaults. Uh, but we flew together just it was just a partnership. Of course, you got in the back two door gunners, uh, crew chief and a door gunner, both enlisted and both brilliant guys. One of my favorite stories is helicopters fly a lot with uh, hydraulic assist. All the controls are hydraulically driven, and if you uh, get a leak in one of the lines, it can you're in trouble. You've got to really fight hard to land the airplane. 
we knew we were losing hydraulic fluid. We could not figure out why. We finally landed, and uh, Private Fuller said, "Sir, we're losing uh, hydraulic fluid back here. So, we'll, you know, what can we do?" And he said, "Stand by." So he whipped out a roll of what you know as duct tape. We called hundred mile an hour tape. He wrapped that around the hydraulic line, poured in a quarter hydraulic fluid. We flew for eight more hours. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, amazing, amazing people served in Vietnam, uh, and you hear these stories like this all the time, uh, just uh, uh, amazing instances of innovative, brilliant work. Well, I'm always right. blown away that, that that so many of the guys that you flew with were 19, 20, 21 years old, and you're throwing them into... Vietnam, which they've probably never even heard of, we and asking them to, yeah, and, and you're asking them to do this unbelievable and sometimes horrifying job. Well, I was 23. I, I had been through college, and uh, I flew with a young uh, one also McMonagall. Couldn't vote. He wasn't 18. <laughs> My gosh. He graduated from high school a year early, got in the program. I got to Vietnam before he was 18. He turned 18 in Vietnam. That's Good amazing. Grief. Now, I think you said, you know, you flew a transport, but can you be more specific? Because one of my favorite all-time helicopters, I had a model when I was a kid, was the Bell Huey UH-1 Iroquois. I still think that is one of the coolest helicopters the military ever ever created. It felt like you could use it for anything. That is my helicopter. That's is it really? It. Yes. Uh uh, Bell developed this wonderful helicopter known as the UH-1. It has model numbers from A way out through M models. Our model, the slick in Vietnam, the troop carrier, was a D model. And then in later years, was an H model with a stronger engine and a stronger transmission, stronger rotor system. But the D model Huey was the one I flew at the time, and the gunships were B models, later C models, and then they went to the Cobra. All of those are Bell helicopter development. So these are the ones that people see in all the Vietnam movies that are flying in and dropping all the guys into into combat, right? Yes, yes. Or at the beginning of Predator. <laughs> or Predator, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I think there were so many made. I mean, wasn't it the reason why Coppola did um, Apocalypse Now in Cuba was because uh, Castro had a whole bunch of the Hueys that he bought, so he could use them to, to for the for the beach assault and the and the and the helicopter scenes because yeah. it was like the one of the most mass produced helicopter. Like everyone wanted the Bell Hueys; they were just such a reliable and versatile helicopter. And actually, they're still flying, and yeah. uh, a lot of the smaller countries around the world, you'll still you'll still find D models uh, out there. Uh, wonderful aircraft. I went through training school in what was then a pretty good helicopter, reciprocating engine. Once you stepped up to the Huey in Vietnam, you had gone to turbine power and uh, a, a totally different experience. I've always described it like I went through training school in a Model A Ford and they sent me to Vietnam to drive a Porsche. And huh. <laughs> The thing would jump out from under you quickly. You had to had to be on it all the time. But we would load it up. Um, they put armor seats in it. And by the time you loaded troops on board uh, in the heat and humidity of Vietnam, it was a struggle to come off the ground sometimes. Well, and I know that one of the one of the big stories that you know I was familiar with when I was a kid was uh, the day it got one of your flights got overloaded and you managed to uh, make it to the ground again, but uh, I know you know what story I'm talking about. Why don't you tell that one? Well, I, I will tell that one. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that is July 20th, 1966. We're moving troops all over the area uh, near a town called Vodot. And um, we uh, normally were able to carry five to six troops, depending on the humidity, heat, fuel loads of things, but you knew when you picked the aircraft up, you knew whether you were heavy or what you could do. 
So on this particular day, we had moved their company, and I had the la- I was the last helicopter in the lift, and uh, my door gunner says, "Sir, we're not. We're supposed to be carrying five, and there's one left over. You want me to leave him here? <laughs> no, we can't leave him. <laughs> get, get him on board." So yeah, because I want to come back. <laughs> yeah. I can it see was the- so much fun coming in the first time. <laughs> I really want to do this again. <laughs> yeah. And you really want to be that one guy who gets left. <laughs> yeah. The guy who's left behind. This is not like you got left behind on your school bus. This, <laughs> right. This, this is serious. <laughs> They're really bad people out there. So we picked the, we picked the airplane up. Um, uh, John T. Myers flying. I'm the aircraft commander. John's got as much time as I do. Uh, uh, but you switched off on the controls all the time. So I'm in the left seat. John's in the right. And uh, we get it up. We're losing RPM coming off the landing takeoff zone. So we know we're in deep trouble going into the uh, uh, deliver these people. And as we're approaching, we've been into this area before. It's high elephant grass up around 12 feet. And anytime you're going into elephant grass, you're losing uh, lift right away when you come into this so we knew in our minds we had to go right straight to the ground there's no hovering letting the troops jump off or anything like that you got to put it on the ground or you'll run out of power so we're coming in and in, the, in, in these circumstances the crew chief door gunner hanging out the back of the aircraft oh uh, another wonderful story they're hanging by a cord standing on the kids hanging out the door looking they can talk to us on a Gosh. Uh, internal mic. And uh, their job is to tell us that the tail rotor is clear. Uh, and so as we're coming in, uh, we're getting clearance, clearance, clearance. We're losing RPM. We're getting, losing power. I'm on with John on the controls. And all of a sudden, you hear this, look out, bam! And it's the tail rotor coming off because it hit a, hit a stump buried deep in the uh, uh, elephant grass. Rips the tail rotor off, rips the 90 degree control box off. Uh, we go into a left spin because that's what the helicopter does when it loses the tail. And uh, it goes uh, 360 degrees around, and we have no control at all. We end up on our left side. Uh, all the smoke grenades in the back are exploding. Um, and uh, I couldn't get out because it was laying on my side of the helicopter. I came out through the roof. Uh, everybody got out. All all six troops were thrown clear. All my crew got out. The helicopter's uh, torn up. And uh, so we get picked up, and uh, we're back to a medical tent not far away. And as we're in there, my company commander, Major Johnson, comes in. He says, uh, Lieutenant, what happened? <laughs> I said, well, sir, uh, you know what happened. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, sure took a, a hard round, a hard hit, and I'm kind of puzzled. I'm like, he said, yeah, son, I stopped by that helicopter and put a couple of forty five caliber rounds in the tailbone. He said, <laughs> I'm about lost. He said, now you get your ass in my helicopter over there, and I want you to fly the rest of the day, because this is like doing a belly buster. If you, if I don't make you fly again today, you may never fly again. I said, yes, sir. Yeah, words I'm of good. wisdom. I was so sore the next day I could hardly move, but, uh, you know, those were combat times, and uh, Major Johnson knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, Later, they did the investigation, and, of course, you know, I had to take the responsibility because I was the aircraft commander, but this stuff happened constantly. Uh, You're working in a real tough environment, uh, lots of heat, humidity, unprepared landing zones. Yeah. and. as a memento, I have the door panel on the wall here, a uh, frame from that helicopter. So even though Walt thinks uh, I'm, I'm ashamed of it and uh, <laughs> a bad wreck, uh, you know, it's just a big laugh. No, it just gave me an excuse when I put cars in ditches and things like that in high school to say, well, yeah, but it wasn't a $4 million helicopter. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's well, true. see, the difference is when you do it big, everybody thinks it's cool. When you just wreck the family car, you're an <laughs> right. asshole. There you go. Right. <laughs> and, and when the government's paying for it, it is not big a deal. <laughs> Look, we're buying these by the thousands. We got more coming. <laughs> right. 
Well, we've spent a lot of time on, on this, but I think it's it's awesome to hear. And the fact that you, you know, a harrowing experience at the time makes for a good story now. But, you know, you were one of the, one of the many lucky ones that came back. This the, the Vietnam was probably the first time in, in my lifetime looking back because my dad also was career military at that time. And so I grew up watching the movies, hearing the stories, going to, you know, he had his drills on in the summer when he was back to being a reservist and we would hear all these guys talking. And as a kid, you don't really appreciate what the troops were being asked to go through. But to me, it's the first politician run war and why it was so poorly run. Mm. Yeah, we may not want to get me started on that. (laughs) No, I don't. (laughs) Yeah, that was not on my list of prepared questions. (laughs) Sorry. I just wanted to comment that I just, I'm so happy that you can talk about the story and that you survived without more than just bumps and bruises, but a lot of people didn't. And it, it, it pains me as being ex, you know, ex Navy myself, my dad being career army, uh, you being a veteran. Um, I just don't, I still think to this day, although it's a lot better, I don't know how much people appreciate what our veterans do day in and day out, even quietly behind the scenes, just doing the simple things. And we should really all appreciate what they've done and what they're still doing. Yes. And I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I'll take this opportunity. Uh, There is a book called I'm Ready to Talk. And this book grew out of a bunch of veterans meeting, uh, eating Mexican food and uh, drinking beer and telling each other war stories. And we concluded that uh, this all need to be written down. Yeah. I'm Ready to Talk was published by Deeds Publishing Company in Athens, Georgia, available on Amazon. And it's about, uh, I think, around 100 stories. And they, they run the gamut, an ambulance driver, a chapl- couple of chaplains, fighter pilots, bomber pilots, uh, infantry types, uh, guys who worked in maintenance, uh, on and on. And you get an appreciation that it, it is all about a large group of people in a team doing this. and. You're only in combat by virtue of either being dumb enough to volunteer for helicopter pilot school or dumb enough to be an infantry officer. So, you know, uh, it's, uh, it was more, it was easily, you could move into areas that were not exposed to combat. And, but in a veterans group, anyone who answered the call, put the uniform on, is a veteran. Here, here, and thank you for your service for what you did for our country. I want to move into returning now, trying to reacquaint your life, get civilian life under you. What drew you at that point toward a career in what would eventually be the FBI, but I'll say in general law enforcement? Uh, seventh grade, First Presbyterian Church, Grenada, Mississippi. I had a girlfriend who invited me to go to her whatever the Presbyterian youth have on Sunday night. And I went there mainly because they had better food than the Baptist church. And uh, an FBI agent spoke. Signed to the Jackson, Mississippi office. I listened to that. Can't remember his name. No idea what his name was. And I thought, I want to do that. So I went to Mississippi State, got an accounting degree. was intending to go on to law school. But at the time, the Bureau required a degree and three years of service, three years of experience. And that experience was a military officer experience qualified. So when I, my whole time, I was aimed at going to the Bureau. Uh, When I came back, we were at Hunter Field in Savannah. That's where Walt uh, was uh, conceived. (laughs) <laughs> hey walk yeah. thanks for that <laughs> surprise immediately after returning well, i was just immediate. content to know that i was conceived <laughs> immediately after returning from vietnam and uh right there yeah. on the tarmac no just kidding <laughs> pretty close <laughs> uh in fact he may have been conceived earlier uh because uh I was supposed to meet his mother in Hawaii for my R and R, middle of my tour, which would have been uh, mid sixty six, early six, uh, mid sixty six, probably September sixty six. We had the trip all planned, 
She had her tickets to fly from uh, Jacksonville, Florida to Honolulu. I was going to come from Vietnam to Honolulu, which was an r and r spot. They decided that the biggest battle of the Vietnam War was going to be fought during the week I was gone. So they camped <laughs> on damn r and rs <laughs> So I caught her by phone just before, a couple of days before she was to leave. So we did not get to meet in Hawaii, and uh, uh, I did not see her again for 360 days. I'm wow. surprised she didn't end up just going on to Hawaii. <laughs> uh, probably because of your grandfather, who uh, yeah, probably was, uh, I wouldn't have thought that was too cool. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, we came back to Hunter <clears throat> and I flew there the last few months and uh, applied to the FBI and uh, reported for training school in March of uh, 68. And the Walt was born. In, in, 12 days later, I think. Uh, and so, as usual, I was out of place at important times. <laughs> and I heard about that for many years. <laughs> but uh, training school was a hoot. Uh, uh, and uh, then we went from there to Springfield, Ohio, to Peoria, uh, Springfield, Illinois, to Peoria, Illinois, then to Columbus, Ohio. And then we finally got to Atlanta. So when you went to the Bureau, of course, J. Edgar Hoover was the director, and uh, putting it kind of in, in history and thinking about, you know, where the Bureau is now versus where it was when you joined, did you have any idea that the Bureau would become what it is as you were going through training? No. Uh, Hoover was a stone dictator. You can look at Stalin, Hitler. Castro, pick them out. Uh, Caesar Augustus, I, I don't care. Hoover was a dictator. Anything <laughs> in the Bureau that happened in the Bureau, uh, Hoover was aware of. And it, the discipline was enormous. It was meant nothing to me. I was accustomed to military, you know, whatever the orders are, that's what we do. Uh, there's, we're not going to debate this. And uh, Hoover ran a very strong operation. Um, the problems with the FBI right now began with Robert Mueller being the director. And at that time, he started hiring people as uh, advisors, specialists in general fields like computer science, etc. And he did not require these people to go through agents training, fidelity, bravery, integrity. They simply were made agents because they had this specialty i.e. Peter Strzok. Uh, this type of individual came in, and you do not have the same dedication to fidelity, bravery, integrity. And, uh, you know, you, you just, you look at the situation today, and I'm horrified. I just, uh, it's beyond belief. I cannot believe these people have destroyed the Bureau. Uh, each uh, Peter Strzok, Comey, the rest of them should be in prison. Okay, before we before we leave to current events, and while I'm trying to salvage what I think is supposed to be an apolitical show. Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Let's I want to back up a little bit because there was a show that unfortunately I think after two seasons on Netflix was canceled, but it was based off of what I think might have been the same time you were coming up through the ranks of the FBI. Walt and I both enjoyed it. It was called Mind Hunter about the guys that decided there was a lot you could learn from what from the from sociopaths and serial killers, and they didn't even have that term. And I don't know if you ever had a chance to watch the series, but I was blown away to think that there was a time where the idea of learning how to profile, learning the ideas that you can profile, looking at habits and patterns, I just thought that's basic law enforcement, and that it wasn't actually even accepted early on by the bureau. Uh, it is basic law enforcement. It's uh, profiling is uh, has turned into a real art, and we called it in my day. Whatever your gut says, uh, you're dealing with a, a a guy, and you get a feel for what he uh, is like, and 
you use your feelings about him in interrogation, etc. However, when it became very scientific, I was right there in the beginning of all this. My first exposure to it was an undercover operation in California. We had done a, a lot of undercover buys and were ready to take everybody down. Behavioral science came in and took a look at the entire case and gave us a set of guidelines for the interview of several of the main subjects. Out fail, those guidelines produced confession because they took a look at personality, the environment, etc. And we were able to do a lot of good. And that was my first exposure. As you know, Hazelwood, the rest of these guys that have written a lot of books in this area go into the murders, the child molesting, the uh, serial killer stuff. And you're right, Mindhunter was a, a, a really interesting study. And uh, it's uh, Hazelwood was the guy that I was most, uh, he wrote a book called Evil That Men Do. Mm. And he took individual serial killer cases and uh, analyzed them. And in many of them, they were cases that local police officers, even FBI agents, uh, other federal agencies, had been involved trying to solve and had not taken this unique look at it. And a lot of that deals with mental health issues. And it is a very accepted science in uh, law enforcement. I thought it was incredible watching the show, knowing that it was based off of the work of the of the the writer, the the the, the agents that kind of created this whole notion of the incorporation of psychology, behavioral science, learning these patterns and how they they can be analyzed, they can be scientifically given some credence as to what you think are the patterns to follow to help maybe identify a subject. I had no idea living uh, in in Bartow County in Georgia that those guys were responsible for a very early case, which actually was featured in the first season of Mindhunter with a girl kidnapped from a bus stop and killed in a Daresville, Georgia, which is about a 15 mile drive from where I live now. So I'm, I'm sad the show got canceled because I was enjoying learning about what it is that you guys were actually implementing as cutting edge law enforcement. What year was that at Daresville? That, that was in actually early it. 70s. It was before we came to Atlanta. It was about five years before the Wayne Williams case started kicking off, before the Atlanta child murders case. Because okay. I worked the child murder case. And it was uh, a, a, a lot of the analysis done in the child murder case was by behavioral science. And they were young uh, and they struggled with it. But they had told us from the get-go that you're not looking for a white guy. And we're like, wait a minute. We figured all these were clan killing. No, no. A white guy could not go down in those neighborhoods and pick off those children. And they were right on the money. So as you were coming up through the Bureau, I know you were in the Bureau 10 years, I think, before we came to Atlanta. Right. So as you were coming up and you were working bank robberies, I guess, and fugitives and stuff like that, how much of that kind of day in and day out law enforcement on the street work is incorporated into profiling people? So when you went through the profiling classes and you heard them talking about this, how much of that were you like, oh, that's just what we do every day? And how much of that was new science? That's a good question because... As, as you know, Walt, from me being your dad, uh, FBI agents are notoriously uh, super confident, super aggressive personalities who think they know everything about everything. <laughs> Hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a second. Walt, why weren't you in the FBI? <laughs> That's a long story for another day. <laughs> Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like anything else you do in life. Uh, if you're a tennis player, a preacher, whatever you do, what, what you guys are doing, 
each day you learn something new, something important that enhances your work product. So my opinion always with behavioral science, and we would never tell them this, we harass them so badly, we call them, you know, wimps. <laughs> you know, that's what to do. Uh, but what you, you realize and they realize is they were looking at our work product from a scientific point of view, is there a better way to do an interview of a person? And a lot of the interrogation methods that were in use by law enforcement through the years, you know, might be just walk in the room and say, hey, Bubba, did you kill June? And uh, you know, if he said no, you know, you might ask a couple other questions. But with behavioral science, before you walk in the room with him, you know what he, where he grew up. Was he in the military? Has he been in prison before? Has he possibly done this before? So you know more about him than he really does. Everything you can know when you walk in the room with this person is important. And I think that's what behavioral science did for a street FBI agent more than anything. Now, my favorite parts of the Bureau are interviewing and testify. I love them both. Obviously, I'll talk forever. Several judges have told defense attorneys, you shouldn't have asked him that question. Mr. Murray will talk forever, <laughs> and I can't shut him down. Uh, so part of all this is if you are serious about your profession, you grab every shred of evidence, every shred of training you can get. And part of that comes from my favorite one of my favorite things is working with local law enforcement. I've got many, many friends to this day that I worked with that were street law enforcement guys, homicide detectives, robbery detectives, um, and you you learn an enormous amount about them because they're just face to face every day with this uh, uh, the criminal mind. Well, I know through the years, one of the things that people have always asked me is. What does your dad think is the best cop show? You know, is it <laughs> whatever? Is that really what it is? And, yeah, oh, well, it cool. is. I mean, it's one of the craziest questions I've always gotten. I mean, there are other things, of course, that come up that are timely. They always ask me, did Wayne Williams really commit all the child murders? And I say, yeah. well, you know, not all of them, but most. <laughs> you know? um, but he is the guy who he was the right arrest. But um, I know. Um, you know, over the years, we've watched a bunch of stuff. Is there any of them that you really look at and go, yeah, that one really kind of captures what street work is like? Well, I'll tell you, for years, I didn't watch any of this, didn't read much of this. But uh, Harry Bosch, uh, series by Michael Conley, uh, caught my attention. I was at a golf outing with a bunch of guys over in Fripp Island, and we were drinking beer and uh, telling each other war stories when started watching the Bosch series on TV. And it's a homicide-driven uh, thing, a lot of drama in there. And the character of Harry Bosch is a smart-ass guy who basically gets the job done all the time. But the uh, that, that would be my favorite show now. Is that indicative of law enforcement? Uh, you'll find a lot in the at the end of Harry Bosch movies. There's a big shootout where there's you know a hundred rounds fired, and there are very seldom shootouts of that magnitude. But uh, still, the uh, the drama, the suspense of the uh, Bosch series would be my favorite. Again, I can't testify that that's <laughs> that accurate. You know that's awesome because ironically, in our season so far. We've mentioned multiple times and other guests have come on talking about either binging or going back and watching. And I recently finished all six seasons, know that they're going to do one more. And I hadn't realized I'd already read a couple of books because what I commented on and what I still love to this day about Michael Connolly is he seems to value the idea of detective work, of the due diligence of capturing information. And that if you look at the murder book, if you look at the information, if you've done your job, the answer is probably there. You're just missing it. And I love when I read the books, there's no last minute twist with a guy shows up that we didn't have for 300 pages prior that did it. It's it's there. It's the story and it's the detective work. And he seems to have a reverence for 
for the officers. And I do enjoy that series. I think it's probably the best show I've seen on TV in a long time. Damn, Alan, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> he, he's reading it off the internet somewhere. <laughs> no, I am not. <laughs> so, 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 oh, Mr. Murray, please stop talking. Just, <laughs> ask me a question on that the was, stand. I, I People hold, they leave rooms. They're like, all right, we're done. <laughs> that was very good. And, and I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I just started reading the first book in that series, and and it is uh, it is a great book. So, well, the second thing I get asked a lot is, what are some of the craziest things that your dad has seen, or some of the craziest things that have happened in his career? Um, and I, I know I could go story after story after story, but when you look back on your career, what are the kind of crazier things that you remember? Well, one of the crazy ones. Um... There is a retired three-star general named Mike Tenavan, who lives on St. Helena Island, South Carolina. Mike was the assistant professor of military science at Georgia Tech. His boss had been my platoon leader in Vietnam. So uh, we had a lot of lunch and drinking beer. And so Mike was going to teach the SWAT team orienteering courses. And so we were down in the woods uh, below Fort Gillum, running around the woods and finish up. And uh, Mike's in the car. He's in uh, full military. His major leaf got his name on his uh, uh, shirt and all this stuff. The radio comes on and says, hey, uh, that fugitive you've been looking for in Union City, they just spotted him down there. He's on uh, the highway right down there. And here's what he's in. So we go screaming down there. Mike's in the car with me. He's scared to death now. And here's a military guy, and he's scared to death. He's with two FBI. <laughs> and so we get there, and sure enough, we spot the car. We run it off the road into a ditch. The guy locks himself in the car and won't come out. Hey, we've got an arrest warrant for you. You're coming out. No, I'm not coming out. Screw you. So I'm thinking, what do we do now? So I go look in the trunk of that car got an army entrenching tool. That's just a fold-up shovel used to dig foxholes. And uh, we'd gotten it as a surplus item. So I walked over to the car and I said, hey, you, you, you know, you come out or I'll break your window. No, I'm not coming out. So the first swing I miss and crease the door of this brand new Cadillac. Uh, that's why I'm not a good golfer. I'm really not a good golfer. <laughs> The second swing, of course, we knocked the window out. And he says, okay, I'm coming out. Nope, nope, you're not coming out except through the window. So we drag him through the window, throw him on the ground, handcuff him, take him to jail. So he files a lawsuit against us for illegal arrest, you know, and on and on and on. And he didn't know my name, and he didn't know my partner, Tim Hughes. Name, <laughs> but he knew Major Canavan's name because he had his name tag on. <laughs> so Major Canavan calls and he says, I named a lawsuit. You've ruined my career. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Mike. It'll go away. <laughs> so, sure enough, uh, in fact, I think Judge Shub, Marvin Shub of the uh, uh, Northern District of Georgia, ruled in the case that uh, the guy had no case. The, the FBI was not paying for his car, or he was going to jail anyway, so don't worry about it. But to this day, I call Mikey up and say, See, I saved your career, kind of man. I made you a major general. <laughs> Lieutenant general, sorry. Three stars, Lieutenant general. So this kind of stuff went on all the time. They're just, you know, so many crazy, crazy stories from the street. And uh, in the FBI, you have a, a leadership level, and then you have the street guy. And so I spent all my time on the street. I did seven years undercover, and uh, there's all kind of crazy stories. Well, let me ask you, as because we we would more than likely need several episodes to catalog all the stories you could tell. <laughs> but one of the ones I always want to know, and, and this is a serious one, is when did you ever, or did you ever have that moment where you thought, especially being undercover, I'm not getting home tonight. This is this just got really, really serious. It got really deep. Did you ever have that moment where everything was about to unravel and you you were in fear of your life? Uh, the day me and my brother accidentally lit the yard on fire and my mom blamed my dad. <laughs> no, that's you. No, that was you guys in fear of your life when your dad came home. <laughs> uh, 
No, I'm just I'm I'm curious because you know we do we we are used to seeing TV dramas. We're used to seeing movies. There's always like you said, you got to have the harrowing moment. But did you have one? No, no. There, there, there's something called uh, arrogance, cockiness, overconfidence. Um, well, I'll put it. Let me put it this way. I'm a Christian. I know what's going to happen when I die. And I thought I was going to die twice in Vietnam. So by the time I came in the bureau, uh, really, a couple of guys pulled guns on us. We took them away from him and uh, bought him for the guns. Probably the scaredest I ever was was on the roof of the Marriott Hotel at, at night, getting ready to rappel down the side of the hotel, thinking, shit. <laughs> Want to jump off the side of this damn hotel on a rope? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that would be the only time. I, other than that, it was just too much fun. Yeah, you you had the personality that you maybe somebody else would think, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe what I'm doing." But for you, having been through Vietnam, I mean, you survived a helicopter crash. I mean, what's you know what's dealing with yeah. a bad guy? With yeah. you know, you're just dealing with another bad guy. I mean, I guess you you were more accustomed to it. Well, as you'll see in the Bosch movies, uh, Bosch has this tendency to get in trouble, and then uh, I'm in trial. There's some supervisor questioning me about something I did, and I said, oh, what are you going to do? I've been sent to Vietnam, and you can't send me to Vietnam, so forget it. (laughs) Yeah, what worse are you going to do, right? (laughs) Right, exactly. And, you know, that's kind of a bad attitude, but it's the street attitude. You, you, I, the job was so much fun. I can't say that I was ever really. You just figured you were going to make it through there, and and I think that goes to um, you know, <laughs> I can't die. Okay, well then, despite your earlier <laughs> comment about the bureau today, as far as a career, uh, you've made it to you know through retirement. You you're now a former agent that doesn't necessarily mean that you're ever gone because they could always call you. People always may reach out and even if it's just reliving stories or looking back, were you satisfied of your career? Did you feel like you did something that you're, 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 you're proud of? Yes, absolutely. 100%. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot in here of dealing with the victim. I I worked a lot of white collar crime, a lot of political corruption type stuff. And uh, when you're dealing with uh, companies, people that have lost a lot of money to scammers, fraud guys, et cetera, uh, it's it's a good feeling when you stuff these people in jail and uh, make them have to pay the money back or whatever. Usually they can't pay it back, but still, uh, that's the objective to... uh, Protecting well, public. I'll say it again because you did it twice. Not only did you serve in the military and, and, and a veteran in a combat situation, but you actually took to the streets and did what you could to, pr- to you know, make America a better place, to get the bad guys off the street. Even if you were having fun doing it, it doesn't matter. You still did it, and thank you for what you've done. Yeah. I appreciate it. Walt, you got anything else you want to ask before we uh, shift gears? Well, I, I know that uh, the um, the question comes up from time to time of law enforcement today, and uh, you know, sh- is it something that I should encourage my kid to do as a career, or yes, is it something that that I should do as a career? And with all the beating that the police take right now, um, I, I think it is still a worthy career for people to follow. Well, if we want to maintain a, a country. We want to be America. If we want to be the United States of America, you can forget Joe Biden and his defunding the police <laughs> and the rest of these knuckleheads because it goes down to what Charles Barkley said. All you rich people are going to still have police, but who's going to come when we call from the ghetto? That's what it comes down to. The people being protected most need the protection the most. You, you can't do it. If you do away with the police, you're now uh, the Soviet Union in 1970. Can't say it any better than that. We've got buddies that came with us, uh, came on with us a few weeks back that are cops in New Jersey. And 
you know, I just, I, I feel for them every day, send them messages as often as I can, just wishing them encouragement because it's hard. It's tough. It's yeah. in, the, in the climate we're in. I'm, I'm really good friends with our sheriff of our county here. We go out all the time and, you know, he said it himself. He goes, it's the last time I'm running. I just don't know that it, it's the profession. It, it, he feels bad because it's such a, a worthwhile profession. And yet it constantly gets put in, in, in a bad crosshair for mostly undue reason. Yeah. Well, we could have a long discussion. About- well, and, and, and I think I'll just wrap it up this way. As a, as a family member uh, who grew up around this stuff and who grew up seeing and knowing FBI agents and, um, and, and knowing the character of all but one, um, that they're just solid people who are trying to do a good job and help people and uh, trying to, you know, help maintain law and order and, you know, help people may be able to maintain the lifestyle that we expect in the United States, not necessarily, you know, the rich being rich and all that kind of nonsense, but keeping people safe, keeping the wolves at bay and knowing so many uh, men and women who've been in the, in the Bureau and knowing that's what they want to do with their lives and taking the risk that comes with it. Uh, I'm proud to say that, that that's what you did as a career and that that's what I grew up around. So, Thank you. Uh, I would hope that uh, people, well, and, and my youngest daughter uh, now wants to pursue a career in the FBI. And <laughs> so, um, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm excited about that. I hope that that is something that she considers as she, as she grows up. So I, I think it's an awesome job. And, I, and the FBI agents that I deal with and have dealt with have all been just great people. So uh, I, I think it's an, an amazing career. Well, it, it certainly was for me, and I great talking to you guys. Thank you very much for the invitation. I've enjoyed it. I'll hang around while you talk. Oh, yeah, I was <laughs> going to say, uh, I thought you were going to hang out with us for our next couple of segments. So, Oh, yes, I will. I'll... Okay, good deal. And by the way, I'm going to say this now because I, I wrote it down, but I don't want to forget it. Um, at some point when we get past all of the uh, mask nonsense and stuff, Walt, you and me should probably figure out a time to knock back a few a few uh, glasses of adult beverage. Cause I bet I would have a blast just sitting down chatting. I don't think you've even got to wait till the whole mask thing's over. I, <laughs> I, I think that uh, dad has basically had the same uh, opinion of masks versus beer that I've had. I love, <laughs> okay, good. I love masks because uh, every time I go on Walmart, I'm looking for who's got a gun. They're going to stick this place. Up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be right. right. <laughs> yeah, you can take the agent out of the FBI, but you can't take the FBI out of the agent. All right. Well, let's go ahead then and move into our next segment. We're gonna call this one. Bring out your dead. <laughs> well, and we we're bringing out a good one today. Uh, Dolores Aguilar, uh, who, <laughs> who is no longer with us. Uh, Dolores is quite the lady. Uh, she was born in 1929 in New Mexico and left us on August 7th. She will be met in the afterlife by her husband, Raymond, her son, Paul Jr., and her daughter, Ruby. She is survived by her daughters, Marietta, Mitzi, Stella, Beatrice, v- Virginia, and Ramona, and a son, Billy. A li- long list of grandchildren that I won't read. And and they close this long, huge list out with, I apologize if I missed anyone. Dolores had no hobbies, made no contribution to society, and rarely, <laughs> rarely shared a kind word or deed in her life. I speak for the majority of her family when I say her presence will not be missed by many. <laughs> Very few tears will be shed and there will be no lamenting over her passing. Her family, <laughs> this just gets better and better. Her family will remember Dolores, and among ourselves, we will remember her in our own way, which will most. (laughs) Jeez. Uh, And we'll remember her in our own way, which were mostly sad and troubling times throughout the years. We may have some fond memories of her, and perhaps we will think of those at some time. (laughs) At some point. But I truly believe at the end of the day, all of us will really only miss what she never had, a good and kind mother, grandmother, <laughs> great, great grandmother. 
I hope she is finally at peace with herself. As for the rest of us left behind, I hope this is the beginning of a time of healing and learning <laughs> to be family again. There will be no service, no prayers, no closure for the family <laughs> that she spent a lifetime tearing apart. Oh, we will not come together in the end to see if to see that her grandchildren and great grandchildren have anything nice to say. So I say here for all of us, goodbye, mom, period. <laughs> oh my goodness. That was written by her child. So, so Dolores mom. Aguilar, good riddance, goodbye and rest in peace. <laughs> wow. Don't let the door hit you with a good Lord split you. Adios. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, once again, folks, <laughs> Don't be Doris or don't be Dolores. <laughs> you know, the lesson our listeners need to get here is you can't come back and control what they say about you. You no. better figure this. You better figure this out ahead of time. Well, and if nothing else, once you're gone. Pick wisely the person who's going to write your obituary. <laughs> oh, dang. Your eulogy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is oh. uh, that was pretty brutal. <laughs> The rest of us will look forward to healing now that she's gone. <laughs> God, yeah. what a legacy. She was quite the lady. I, I wish there was more explanation on some of these, but uh, but there we go. There's Dolores Aguilar. Excellent. Well, always a, a fan favorite. Thanks to our vote in the uh, listeners poll. Everybody loved this. And so we expanded it at, recently in the last couple of episodes. And from now on, a new segment we, that we like to call the Bring Out Your Dead. Now it's time for the new segment that we like to call... It's no bullshit. Well, I don't know. This one might be. Um, this is from NPR.org. And um, I don't know, Alan, if you're aware of this, but um, there is a town in New York called Swastika, New York. I was unaware. Well, buckle your seatbelt. Michael Alcamo lives in New York City, but loves cycling through the Adirondack Mountains in northern New York with their tiny towns and hamlets and historical cemeteries. He was on a trip like this, winding through a remote stretch this summer, when he noticed something else, a small brown street sign with the name Swastika. Alcamo found the name of the unincorporated hamlet uh, he had crossed to be a little unsettling, which you would. This is a quote. So the effect was just jarring and profoundly disrespectful, I thought, especially to World War II veterans whose graves are nearby. I think it should be obvious that the town should update its name and should pick a name that is not so offensive to so many Americans and so emblematic of intolerance, hate, and tyranny, he said. So Alcamo reached out to the, to the county officials in August to see if they would consider a name change. He was soon directed to email the town of Black Brook, New York, a town of 1,500 residents with jurisdiction over swastika. The town agreed to add it to its agenda for their meeting that, that month. And after five minutes of discussion on September, 19, or September 14th, the town's four counselors unanimously voted to keep the name. Oh, you kidding? <laughs> and here's a quote. Hey, it's our heritage. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah, so John Douglas, Blackbrook supervisor, says Swastika was named by the founders of the area who settled there. None of the counselors returned a request for comment. Douglas says the Hamlet's name far predates World War II and came from the uh, Sanskrit word meaning well-being. The four-sided geometric character that represents the swastika has been used for thousands of years in Indian religions and seen as a symbol of good luck. The swastika's meaning was overshadowed. You may remember this. The swastika's meaning was overshadowed in the 30s with the rise of Adolf Hitler, who co-opted the figure as a symbol <laughs> for Nazism and anti-Semitism, which some of us may remember that from our history books. Douglas said that this is not the first time the Hamlet's name has been scrutinized. This is another quote from him. There was a concern that due to the <laughs> damn it, there was a concern that due to the Germans and everything that people may may have a different outlook on the name. And some of the, res, the residents that were from the area actually fought in World War II and refused to change the name because, just because Hitler had tried to tarnish the name swastika. 
Douglas says the council did not see a reason to change the name despite its widespread use as a symbol of hate and white su supremacy today. He says, I think that's probably maybe some viewpoints that I've that have been associated with hate, but when I but then I believe there are others who do not associate it with hate. So I mean, all I can get from Mr. Douglas is that there are people who associate the swastika with something bad, and there are people who associate it with something good. Did the Hindus and the Buddhists and all of them, did they erase it from their religious history just because of the Germans? Alcamo, the cyclist who submitted the request, was disappointed with the town's reactions. I didn't expect a quick unanimous vote to reject the proposal, he said. Social media's response to the decision has been murkier with some locals of the region bristling on Facebook that an outsider from New York City was trying to meddle in their rural affairs. <laughs> oh, my God. But Alcamo says he simply wants more people to see the Adirondacks for their, their natural beauty and deep history. A history, he says, that it is, is at odds with the meaning of the word swastika today. It's no... So, so, despite the town's founders and and, uh, and town council, I, I would think that it might be a good idea to change the, the town name, but apparently not. You know what? All I kept thinking was a Jeopardy category uh, for a thousand points. Name the hill you probably shouldn't be dying on. <laughs> right. Well, and I love I love the fact that the council points out that yeah. This, this town name may have slightly been tarnished by something that happened in the 30s, but we're all good now. But that was so long ago. Who really knows? Who really remembers? Right. Dear Lord. You know, I get, I get the whole idea of preservation of history and culture, but at some point you go, yeah, not the hill I'm going to die on. It just, we, okay. No. How about we call ourselves like Uberville? And, you know, both of us live in Georgia. Georgia takes a beating over some of the crazy crap that happens down here. But this is in New York. This is in the Adirondacks. So uh, take that, New York. Yeah, right in the kisser. I got the next one here. It's, uh, well, it just goes to show that some people take social media, well, more importantly than their own safety. Woman falls onto highway while recording on Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Awesome. <laughs> you heard that right. She was on Snapchat and was so busy trying to record a video, she actually fell onto a highway. That is awesome. Turns out the woman didn't sustain any injuries, so that's good. But being on Snapchat in the car and then falling out because of it? Really? In Surrey, England on Saturday, police shared on Twitter that an unnamed person was hanging out of their vehicle while filming a Snapchat video. The car was driving down the M25 south of London when the incident occurred. Police wrote that the passenger, quote, fell out of the car into a live traffic lane. It is only by sheer luck she wasn't seriously injured or killed. They are also including a picture of the passenger window where the woman had fallen from with the hashtag no words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that. Users asked Perfect. police if the woman had been arrested or not, and you may be surprised at the answer. According to the Surrey police, there was no necessity to arrest. We can't just arrest people for fun. We have to have a necessity, which we did not have for this. We knew who she was, where she lived. There will have been plenty of evidence and no person or property was likely to be at any further risk. Even without an arrest, police hope that others will then learn from the incident itself. Now, how is that not against the law to throw yourself out of a moving vehicle into the, into the interstate? I guess just being stupid, you can't necessarily arrest somebody. Yeah, and generally laws are written after someone does something really stupid or whatever. So I, I guess they just never anticipated that you'd be dumb enough to throw yourself out the car window. Well, as the story wraps up, when asked if the police ever told passengers of the errors of their ways, they responded with, every chance they worked it out before we spoke to them about it. Statistics show... 259 people around the world died between 2011 and 2017 while taking selfies. Just oh. last year, a 23-year-old woman was hit and run over due to flying out of a car window after yelling, Bye Miami, from the right passenger window. The woman was struck by a Range Rover whose driver did initially stop and pull over, 
but then left the scene. It's no bullshit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, don't don't lean out the window. That's that's not good stuff. So lesson oh, learned. Stay off Snapchat. Stay off Snapchat and uh don't try to hang out the window on the interstate. Wow. Okay. Well, our good friends from the smoking gun add to the stupidity of America. Um, with this gem, police say a drunk driver crashed his car into the drive sober or get pulled over sign. <laughs> <laughs> That's irony. <laughs> so meet 22-year-old Bounty Chirmy, a Florida resident who was arrested for drunk driving early Sunday after allegedly slamming his Mazda into an electronic sign cautioning motorists to drive sober or get pulled over. According to a probable cause affidavit, cops found Chirmy outside his car around 12.30 a.m. on the Tamiami Trail in Port Charlotte on the state's Gulf side. <laughs> Jeremy's auto had sustained heavily, heavy front end damage. Reportedly, a deputy also noted that, <laughs> that the county sign board trailer had been struck. Jeremy told police that he was talking on the phone when he suddenly struck something, but was unsure what he had struck and how he had hit it. Jeremy smelled of alcohol, was swaying back and forth, and could not focus on questions posed by a deputy, the affidavit alleges. He performed poorly on a series of field sobriety tests, took two breath tests, both of which recorded his blood alcohol content at twice the .08 legal limit. Mm. Jeremy was charged with a pair of DUI counts and careless driving. It's no bullshit! So a big sign that says, don't drink and don't drive. I guess he uh, couldn't really read that. I love the irony. And I was worried we were not going to have a Florida man story this week. Oh, no, you can always count on Florida man. Always count on Florida man to make sure that they pick up where everybody else drops off because they are all in all the time. Well, I've got the last story, and this one only goes to show we need to continue to look at how to decouple ourselves from our dependence on China. I want you to picture this. I mean, we're in the Halloween season right now. You're walking in pitch black darkness through the narrow corridors of an industrial sized hangar. You're sweaty and nauseated. The air is thick with intense heat, humidity, and the stench of rotting meat. But the worst thing of all is that awful, ever present noise all around you. It almost sounds like the pitter patter of rain, but it's nothing so wholesome. Do you know what that terrible sound is? The scurrying footfalls of a billion palm-sized cockroaches. Nice. Now, what's worse is this is not a scene from a Hollywood horror blockbuster. This is the everyday reality of being a cockroach farmer. Yes, there are people who farm these revolting pests. In China, cockroach farms are a burgeoning business with an estimated 100 farmers already active across the country. The farm described is managed by a gentleman and a professional bug farmer. His facility is located in eastern China near the city of, Jin, of, of Jinan. On the map, that's roughly halfway between Beijing and Shanghai. He said, quote, we have 60 small rooms, and in each room, 20 million cockroaches can be found. So a total of 1 billion in this farm. Oh, Every day, the gosh. farm's impressively elaborate system of pumps and pipes dumps 50 tons of kitchen waste collected from restaurants onto shelves and in case you're wondering what the rotting meat stink was that's it they eat all of it every single day but why do you ask why in the world would you do this well there's two reasons first of all the whole thing was started as an experiment to first deal with food waste makes a particularly twisted kind of sense cockroaches thrive wherever there's decaying food but then what are you supposed to do with all the cockroaches at some point right Well, here's what they're doing. You can kill them, grind them into powder, and add them as a protein nutrient to food. (laughs) No, no, you can't. You cannot do that. (laughs) Yes, yes, they are. (laughs) Right now, they're saying mixed into animal feed, the roach powder creates a cheap, nutritious, and practically everlasting feed supplement saying we can farm cockroaches on a large scale that keep the protein benefits for the entire ecological cycle. 
We can replace animal feeds with antibiotics and instead simply supply organic feed with all the nutrients they need. But what if you're against maybe feeding that to your horse or your animals or your cows or maybe unintentionally to your brothers or sisters as part of their protein supplements? Well, how about this? Even if the animal business goes bust, most of the roach farms supply China's traditional medicine industry. Oh. Crushed roaches are said to be useful for healing scars, and traditional healers claim that when drunk in a medicinal concoction, they will reduce the size of, tr- of tumors. Wow. No, I'm good. I'll just die. I'm not making that up. But it's not only in China that people are looking into making something good out of cockroaches. Scientists at India's Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine have found that cockroach milk... Wait, did you hear that? Yes, cockroach milk. The Pacific beetle cockroach is unique among their whole wretched species in that it gives birth to live young, and so to feed its verminous offspring, the roach lactates protein-dense crystals which pack fats, sugars, amino acids, and more than four times the nutrition of cow's milk. Are you ready for your roach milk? It might be coming to a store near you. It's amazing. It's astounding. But it's no bullshit. Oh, that is, uh, that is disgusting. Isn't that the... Isn't well, that- clinic in uh in india the same one where the the uh chimpanzee escaped with all the coronavirus <laughs> vials <laughs> stole stole all the blood yeah. samples with people that might be infected <laughs> with covid19 yeah, that place is a mess <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh name two places i don't care to visit alex <laughs> for a thousand please oh my gosh oh that is horrifying All right, so there's your news now it's time for us to get into the world of entertainment and we need to invite your your pop back in to find out what he might be reading, watching, and listening to. Well, we'll go to you first. What are you watching? We'll look at the watching first. Watching or streaming? Any shows you can recommend? Yeah, you know, I actually um, took your advice and I've started watching High Score, uh, which is about the history of the video game industry. And it is really fascinating. I, I mean, there's just so much there that I had no idea of how the industry started, just the boom. Um, and, and, you know, they were talking in episode one about the armored cars pulling up with just bags and bags and bags stuffed full of coins from all mm-hmm. of the. I mean, it is really amazing. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, also on Amazon Prime, there. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's on Netflix this month. There's a great documentary if you're a James Bond fan called "For Our Eyes Only." Have you seen that one yet? Not yet, but now I'm writing it down. It is really good. There's going to be a lot in there. I know you and uh, and BK were talking about uh, James Bond over the weekend uh, on his show. Uh, there'll be a lot there that you already know, but there's a lot there that you don't. And it, it's a really interesting history of James Bond and all those movies. And then the the last thing I just started watching today, a a show called Utopia. And it stars Rain Wilson from The Office and a bunch of other people. And it is about an outbreak. I guess where it's leading is that there is a guy or group of people who keep weaponizing viruses and unleashing them on humanity. So it's almost too timely, but it looks like a really good show. I'm about halfway through episode one right now. and Really good so far. Good acting and looks to be well written. So I'll kind of keep you all up to date as I watch through that in the next couple of weeks. All right, let's move on to our guest. We've got George. So as far as uh, binging, watching, you already did a shout out earlier to the series Bosch, which is always worth revisiting. What else you might be watching? Well, right now, uh, I'm highly intellectual stuff. Braves and the Reds at one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, the Braves clinched the NL East and a second seed, so now they got to f- well, they're going to take on uh, with the Cincinnati, right, in the first yeah. round. Yeah, uh, Wednesday at noon. That's not scary at all. <laughs> so uh, that's my uh, watching right now. Uh, reading is a different story. 
Um, well, we'll get to reading in a sec. We're just doing the watching right now, so that way we can kind of keep it all in chunks. Is there anything you would recommend, though, that you've binged? Anything, maybe a documentary or something you've watched recently that you thought particularly good? Um, well, kind of on a lefty... Uh, uh, I was looking <laughs> at the Smithsonian <laughs> night, and uh, th- there was an excellent uh, piece on uh, global warming. And uh, this guy had studied uh, animals all over the world, and there were tremendous shots of uh, his uh, dealing with everything from gorillas to the coral reefs. Now, of course, he's uh. opinion everything's dying because uh, we're killing it. But uh, <laughs> in credit, he uh, just some spectacular animal uh, and nature type stuff, and, and that's that's kind of a favorite area. Okay. For me, uh, we have just wrapped up Longmire season two, and Walt, it definitely got much better in season two. The the subplot of the of his wife and his relationship with uh, what may be going on behind the scenes, and um, I am just I'm I'm definitely much more into season two. It took an entire season to kind of keep me watching. My wife and I, though, every now and then we look at an episode and go. Now, wait a minute. They just left the scene of the accident. They're back, and they've already got an <laughs> autopsy report. Wait a minute. Right, and or, they're in rural Wyoming. And, right. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of time. problems with like the time and how people can bounce immediately from place to place and show up where they need to at the last second for storytelling purposes. But in general, um, outside of those little flaws, I've, I've actually even enjoyed watching the characters start to figure out, or the actors, I should say, figure out how to own their characters and they're no longer just saying lines. I, I'm not saying that about the lead. I think the guy that's playing Longmire is doing a really good job, but I think in general, some of the other characters are finally acting like they understand their part in the story. So uh, Longmire season two, looking forward to now starting season three, just wrapped up season five of Star Trek, the next generation. So two more to go starting season six. Let me ask you a question about Longmire. Okay. Uh, without destroying your watching, have you seen the um, episode where uh, he has a bear in a cage? Yes. Excellent, excellent method of interviewing. In the- <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, well, one might call it that. <laughs> I just thought I'd point that out. It's very motivational. It, w- it would be. <laughs> Hey, you either have something to fear or nothing to fear. <laughs> Pick one. No, I, uh, I, I've, been, I've been enjoying that. Have you seen all of the Longmire episodes? I've seen most of them. I got to okay. put it off Longmire into Bosch and others, but uh, I have a, my bride here is not real keen on Longmire. She likes Bosch. So, okay. Uh, I live in a uh, female-dominated world. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> Walt and I are very familiar yeah, with that. Yeah, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, I got the wife and four daughters, so I actually outpaced Walt by one. Yeah. Now, I will tell you, I, between the two, and maybe it's because of the writing or maybe because of the realism, I do think Bosch is the much stronger of the two, but I am enjoying finally how the characters are becoming sort of their own in, in season two of Longmire, so we are definitely going to continue to watch into season three. All right, so let's go to reading. Walt, we'll go back around the horn to you. Anything that, anything on your bookshelf today? Well, like I said, I had um, started the the first in the series of the uh, Bosch books, and I'm enjoying that. Uh, and I is that the Black Echo? The Black Echo. Yep, that's it. Okay. And uh, so, what time I have to read? That's what I'm working on. Uh, I have been much more into. Uh, catching up on news and sports the last couple of weeks, but uh, definitely looking forward to the Seinfeld book coming out in a week or two. And I've got a, a couple of history books that I just picked up. So I'll be diving into those in the next couple of weeks as well. So yeah, I've got a, I got a lot on my shelf to catch up on. All right. Well, we got a dual purpose for asking your dad about books because we want to now give another plug for the book he mentioned earlier. And certainly want to uh, explain why it's even more important because I believe a chapter in that book does belong to your dad's story. So George, before we talk about maybe what else you're reading, I want you to plug the book that you were talking about a little bit earlier about they're ready to tell their story. Okay. The uh, title of the book is I'm ready to talk. 
subtitled Vietnam Vets Preserve Their Stories. And the publisher is Deeds Publishing out of Athens, operated by Bob Babcock, who was a rifle company commander with the 4th Division in Vietnam. And uh, this book contains uh, uh, a list of stories by guys who are members of the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association. Uh, this business association has existed for about 30 years, and um, we put up plaques around Atlanta, the 21 uh, bronze plaques around Atlanta that honor people who lost their lives in Vietnam and who were from Atlanta. Uh, some you might uh, run into is if you go through Concourse 1 at uh, Hartsfield and look up on the wall, there is a tail rotor from a cobra on the wall, and it honors a uh, young warrant officer who was uh, killed in Vietnam. Uh, there are 21 of the plaques around Atlanta and a variety of different places. And uh, this book uh, was put together, and I've got three chapters in it. Uh, my best one is A Visit to the Vietnam Wall, confronted by a bunch of uh, middle school, high school kids. Wow. And they were great. They uh, accompanied me looking for panel nine where Joseph Sampson is listed. He was my classmate who was killed right behind me in Vietnam. And uh, these kids, uh, we've got a lot to look forward to because they're great patriots. Uh, this was the spring break in 2008. So uh, three of my stories are in the book. Uh, all of them are mostly hilarious. Now, found on uh, Amazon and other book retailers. Can you just go online and look for it? Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's on Amazon. I checked just before we came on, and it, it definitely is on Amazon. Yeah, and all we'll right. post awesome. that when this episode comes out. So right. Yeah, I'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes. What else might be, might you be reading? Since uh, I gather you're a connoisseur of of reading. Yeah, and I am, and uh, you will note that uh, Justice Ginsburg passed away. But in the time of her death, and uh, however they honored her, taking her all around the country, also there was a passing of a gentleman named Winston Groom, who is the author of Forrest Gump, but who also has written a series, different series of books, all very historic. One of his great ones is. Uh, a storm in Flanders, examining World War One in Flanders Field. One I'm reading now is called The Allies. It uh, focuses on Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill during World War Two. And to give you a taste of the, just the footnote here, you know that in World War One, uh, trench warfare was the name of the game. Lots of mud, blood. Uh, bodies everywhere, rats all over the place, <laughs> rats all over the place. So the French came up with this unique solution to the rat problem. They went all through Paris and picked up all the feral cats they could find and <laughs> delivered them to the front lines and let them go in the trenches to eat the rats. So Winston Groom, to me, is one of the great, authors of uh, historic novels and uh, get a great appreciation for some of his work. Uh, the Allies is a real favorite of mine. Great. All right. Well, I already went to you. So it's me. I'm doing the same as you. I, uh, I'm so busy with news and digesting news uh, in the midst of uh, campaign season and everything going on. Uh, unfortunately, it, it is what it is. We're in a period where whenever there's a, a presidential run-up, the news hits sometimes almost every day. There's a new headline, there's a new breaking story, there's a new inside scoop. It's almost impossible to stay on top of it all. And based on what I do in media, I've got to do my best to try to at least have some sense of what's happening, what's real, what's not, what's the hype, what's the headline, what's going to be changed tomorrow, what gets walked back, what is true, what's not. And I just feel like I just I can't wait. We're going camping in a, in a couple of days. 
I'm going to bring a couple of the Harry Bosch books with me and do my best to try to pull myself out of news. But it's going to be tough because there's so much going on. I, I, in some ways, I can't wait for November 4th because at least the campaign ads and the bulk of all of the nonsense should at least come to an end. Now, we may be in the middle of a recount. We might be in the middle of, of, of litigating who's the winner. But at this point in time, it's just I can't wait for November 4th for that one reason. And then I don't care which side of the aisle you're on. I just I think everyone's tired of the campaign ads. Yeah, I agree. I think everyone's ready for this one to be over. All right, so let's go to what you're listening to, whether it's a podcast, and I'll do some podcast shout outs too. So if there are any, even if you have skipped some weeks, if there's an ep- if a podcast you really have enjoyed or really want to uh, steer people to, Walt, we'll go to you first. Yeah, I um, I was introduced to the Norm McDonald Live podcast this week. Uh, we are, we reached out to um, one of the staff members on uh, Norm staff who has agreed to come on the show. We're working on scheduling that, but I started listening through some of his shows and you'll remember Norm, of course, from Saturday Night Live. He's got a great uh, series on Netflix that's just kind of a talk show. And this is a continuation of that. And it is really, really good. I am really impressed with how good Norm is as a uh, talk show host. He asks some real insightful questions. He does a great job of letting the guest be the guest and and, um, you know, answer those questions and talk. And so it's a really fun show to listen to. And of course you also get his, um, sarcasm and, and humor mixed in, but it's called Norm McDonald live. I had to find it on a really obscure app called the, called mix cloud, which I'd never heard of, but apparently it's all over the place, but, uh, check that out. Norm McDonald live. And, um, I'm, listening to the Jerry Seinfeld episode on there right now. And it's really great. Cool. So anything else? Uh, no, I've, again, I've just been so busy. It's hard to keep up. I mean, I, I've talked about four or five other podcasts I'm listening to and I'm trying to plow through a lot of those. So um, just kind of got a lot on my plate listening wise. All right. We'll go back over to your dad, George. I don't know if you're into podcasts, which ones you might be listening to, but are there any that uh, strike your fancy? Well, actually, I'm a total rookie in podcasting, uh, and uh, because of my wild and crazy son here, <laughs> I've become uh, uh, interested in, uh, I'm uh, listening to Hulk Hagerbacks, which I find uh, really interesting. Uh, he had a tremendous career in law enforcement and as a coastie, so uh, I'm enjoying that podcast, which will lead me to others. I too am very busy. You know, it's really tough being retired. <laughs> I, keep, I, I keep telling you there are golf podcasts out there if you want to check them out. So well, I have. Uh, I, I've looked at, I do a lot of pot, uh, video looking at how to improve my swing. I'm uh, 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 busily engaged in uh, how to sight the uh, red dot sight on my new six eye rifle. You know, just important. all the important stuff. Yeah. Well, I can't believe you haven't uh, you, that Walt hasn't given you a handful of true crime or 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 detective related podcasts that wouldn't have struck your fancy. That that's a huge market in the podcast world where people look up uh, unsolved mysteries or crimes that you didn't know anything about, and they break it down almost in a news format. There's just so much content out there. I'll have to look at some of that uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, you know, you you talk about how busy you are, and the only only thing I can tell you, young kids, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> oh, good. Right. I'm so busy. I can't. Uh, and I do have to play golf. So, you know, uh, that along with a, a little bit of business I do, uh, and, and I read as much as I can, but um, it, it, it really, uh, at this age, I'm just amazed at how busy I am. Well, that's awesome. Stay busy because I, I will tell you, I, I think that's what led to my dad's early passing was retirement because he didn't have anything to look forward to doing anymore. And too many people that once their career is done, they, they didn't develop hobbies, passions or other things outside of work and they just sit there. And I think that's what did it to my dad. So I think that's awesome. My mom is as busy as she ever was because she's involved with her church. She's involved with groups. She's like always on the go. I think it's awesome. Um, yep. I will. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. No, no, that, that, I agree with you. Um, I will say uh, for me, uh, I don't have golf in my life just yet, although it's something I would love to play and try sometime. 
but I explained to my wife, uh, doing the podcast is like my version of golf. As much as there's effort and work and time, I love every minute of it. I feel like it's just, it's a noble pursuit, even if, you know, it never goes more than a few thousand listeners. It's still, we've had so many stories of people who, whose lives we've touched or brought humor to their lives when they were going through some trauma or some, some serious, uh, you know, ailments. And so you can't put a price on that. So I just, I wish for everybody to find a passion they love doing and that the time invested doesn't feel like wasted time. It feels like you're doing something worthwhile. True, true. The podcast I'm going to give a shout out to because these are on my rotation. And by the way, as busy as I am, there's nothing better to me than putting on a pair of headphones when I've got to mow the lawn, take care of the gardening, go outside and do some menial work. Got to got to do the day-to-day tasks. I can at least put the wireless headphones on and block out the world. And I get in, and, and these are the shows that are always in my queue whenever there's a new episode. Uh, you got to follow the Marine Corps Movie Minute. These guys just started their first season uh, several months ago. They're about to wrap up in the next few weeks. The, they're doing uh, Heartbreak Ridge. Walt and I, we were on it uh, toward the end, and those episodes are coming up, so watch for that. Uh, Golden Rage of TV, if you're a fan of all of the, the, the TV shows that, uh, Walt, you and I grew up probably watching in reruns, but they're the golden age of television. He does a great job of putting some mini documentaries together to tell you about who was behind the scenes, the work they've done, the producers. I love it. If you want to go across the pond to the UK, the 60MW podcast, it is an entertainment and culture-driven podcast. Not safe for work, but those guys are hysterical. The Real Queens of Queens up in New York. All the ladies, three ladies, uh, Fran, Kat, and Michelle, all from uh, Queens, New York. They're all in there with their accents, talking about what it was like. Uh, the Bad Cop, Bad Cop show. BK on the Air's Escape Pod. Geek to Me Radio. And I got to do one more shout out to Radio Labyrinth. Those guys are right here in Atlanta. Tim Andrews, uh, we're going to try to get him on our show. Uh, the Man of a Thousand Voices. You hear him every weekday morning on WSB from 9 to noon on the Von Hessler Doctrine. He's got a podcast that's called The Radio Labyrinth, and it's always about what's going on. Current news, current culture. It's billed as the podcast for Gen Xers, which is just right up um, our alley, Walt, and you and I. We, we And we love listening to that show as well. So. Big shout out to all of them. I think if any of those interests sound like something you'd like, then download, subscribe, and listen to them. They're all good shows. Yeah, and I try to listen to Radio Labyrinth every week. It is one of the most entertaining podcasts out there. So as we begin to wrap up, I got to say, George, thank you so much for sharing your time and, and being with us on the show, being our guest this week, your time from being in the military to your career in the FBI and commenting on some of the things that we're, we're watching, reading, and and listening to thank you for being with us thank you it's been yeah. a pleasure yeah thanks dad i appreciate it yep bud y'all, y'all have a tell my granddaughters hello walt <laughs> you always you always wrap it up for us you got to give everybody the who's the what's and the why's to follow us in between episodes yeah the best place to catch up with us is going to be over at facebook.com slash the wilder ride and you want to follow us there and then join the listeners group as we say every week, the listeners group is just a great place to get away from politics and all the other stuff. Uh, you get some entertainment, you get some news about our show and uh, other stuff along that line. Nothing too serious, but hopefully a lot of fun. Uh, also, go to patreon.com slash the wilder ride and check out right now our free content, which soon will go back behind the paywall. But we've covered a number of movies, including The Big Lebowski and uh, quite a few others uh, with some friends of ours and a couple that we've covered ourselves. Hey, and let me jump in there because right now we're in the midst of the Halloween ramp. That's what I was about to in. say. Okay. Yep. I'll, I'll take out my, blah, blah, blah. I'll erase this and leave it to you. <laughs> no, it's just good to know that you and I are on the same page for once. That we're both thinking poltergeist. Poltergeist. And, uh, yes. Yes. And that was a, a lot of fun to break down a uh, movie. I had not watched in a while and freaked me out when I w- watched it again. <laughs> And uh, so that's a lot of fun, great movie. And you can find that on patreon.com slash the wilder ride. And we really ought to repost that in the listeners group as well, but uh, check that out, get ready for Halloween. And uh, that's a great one to, to revisit and come back next week. Everybody, every Tuesday morning, a brand new episode drops. You're going to want to stick around and find out who that is, but the only way to do it is subscribe. So you don't miss the episode and come on back to our wilder ride listeners lounge. I still need to get somebody to sing us out. Yeah, we don't have anybody to sing. Did your dad sing? No. 
you know, he's got us on mute right now, so we can't even hear him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I learned to sing from him, and uh, so Is that I get what a that lot was? of. Yeah, I, 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 I get a lot something of. Something got caught in the engine. <laughs> <laughs> well, one time we we joined a church, and this lady was like, "Amy, it's so great to have you here. You need to join the choir. You're great." Oh, hey, Walt. And the <laughs> choir meets on Tuesdays. <laughs> Uh, you know, gotcha. I was told there's no such thing as a bad singer. We all can make a joyous noise until they say, well, we're wrong. Apparently, there is one person who is. You can hum. Just throw a couple of songs.